Did you ever stop to think what it is that makes someone open a pocketbook? Or fill out and put his signature on a check? Or reach into his pocket for his wallet? Or count out some silver? Whatever it is, the way people buy, why they buy, and how much they buy is extremely important to every man connected with the retail business, no matter what he is selling. Every kind of retailer has a vital interest in any change in consumer buying habits. The last such change began to take place over 10 years ago, when World War II caused shortages of almost everything that people use and want. Under wartime rationing, a retailer's problem was getting enough goods to meet the demand. People bought what he had without any selling effort on his part, creating what we call a seller's market. And that seller's market didn't end with the end of the war. Post-war setbacks in production meant continued shortages of many essential commodities. And so we have had a succession of crises, allocations, rationing, substitutes, ceiling prices. For years, business generally has been much more concerned with the problem of producing things than with selling them. This is the background for the retail marketing picture as it exists today. As customers ourselves, we're all familiar with, to put it mildly, the general indifference that exists as far as selling anything is concerned. In fact, at one time or another, many of us have probably had a take it or leave it experience like this one, shown in a motion picture called The Hidden Camera. Young man, will you wait on me, please? Sorry, I didn't know you were in a hurry. What are you looking for? I'd like to see some men's shirts, size 1532, a dress shirt. Size 15, huh? Uh, how many do you want? Well, I'd like to see them, if you don't mind. Here's one, three dollars and twenty-five cents. I see. Uh, do you have these in any other colors? Yeah, uh, we got other colors, blue, tan. Uh, I think we've got some grays. Uh, may I see them, please? Well, they're just like this, only different colors. What color do you want? Well, I'd like to see them before I decide. Don't you even know what color you want? You said this was three twenty-five. That's right. Well, it says here they're two ninety-five. Oh, must be old stock. Uh, the price has gone up. I guess the boss forgot to mark these over. Well? Well, what? Well, did you decide what color you want yet? Well, I, I think I'll shop around a little bit more. Thank you, just the same. God, they're getting worse every day. In this episode from The Hidden Camera, a service is involved rather than a product. Hello? Is this a shop? Let me talk to Fred. Oh, Fred, this is Kelly. I'm over at that house on Shore Drive. Uh, yeah, that's it, the wiring job. I'm putting some wall plugs in the bedroom. Hell no, I ain't finished. I know I've been here all day. That's why I called you. Look, I've got them all hooked up, but uh, half of them don't work. Sure, I get juice. Oh, yeah, I'll wait. What's the matter? Somebody else wanted to talk to them for a minute. Are they going to send over someone else? Search me, lady. Don't think we got anybody else. All the rest of the guys are busy. Yeah, no, I sure wish I'd made up my mind to be a carpenter instead of an electrician. A lot easier work, more dough. Do you know any more about carpenter work than you do about installing wall plugs? I know how to install wall plugs. Just don't like the job, that's all. Are you going to patch up that big hole? You know that? Well, the plaster must have been weak. You know, these new houses ain't so hot when it comes to being well built. Well, this house is 10 years old. Oh, that, that hole looks terrible. Uh, yeah? Uh, just a minute, lady. Yeah, Fred. Well, look, like I told you, I got them all hooked up, but uh, half of them don't seem to work. Drop what wire? Third wire from the switch? Huh, geez, I don't know. I didn't see any other. Tell him to come over himself. 
It's almost 5 o'clock, lady. You're in overtime as it is. I don't care. I want this job finished today. The man said yeah, it would only take a couple of hours to install those four plugs. You've been here all day and still not finished. Uh, just a minute, Fred. She's saying something. Look, lady, I don't make the estimates. I just do the work. Will you Go please on, ask him to come over himself and finish the job? Uh, Fred, she says she wants you to come over. Yeah, right now. Huh? Well, the way I figure, the whole house ought to be rewired along modern lines. Yeah, the wiring's all bad. Well, it was built over ten years ago. She admits it. Uh, yeah? Uh, okay, okay. I'll, I'll wait here for you, right? Oh, uh, by the way, tell, tell Nettie to check out my time card for overtime, okay? Five o'clock. All right. You think I lost one of the wires on the wall somewhere? Can <laughs> you imagine anybody being that dumb? Here's another familiar episode taken from the hidden camera. Good afternoon, folks. Oh, good afternoon. What can I do for you today? We're looking for a new Davenport. <laughs> good, you came to the right place. Here they are. A bit expensive, though, but on the other hand, what isn't expensive these days? <laughs> <laughs> You're right at that. Uh, how much do you want to spend? Well, isn't it a little more important that you find out what kind of Davenport we have in mind? What color, where we want to use? Oh, I just, I just thought I'd save a little time. Uh, I mean, assume, uh, well, what'd you have in mind? For our recreation room. We think we want a leather one, red. If it isn't too expensive. Well, how much, I mean, uh, well, what do you say we look around? Now, here's a nice full-size one. That's red, too. This leather or plastic? Oh, it's genuine leather, I guess. At least it looks like leather. Maybe some sort of plastic. Don't you know? Oh, yes, uh, it's that new plastic. It's much better than leather, and it's easy to clean, too. It's made out of two fans. How does it compare with other plastic leathers? Well, to tell the truth, I don't know. Anyway, I guess one kind is just as good as another. It looks similar to the material on that Davenport at the Blair store. <laughs> yes. Well, the way they make stuff today, none of them are too hot, if you ask me. That isn't what the man said at the Blair store. He was quite sure his product was better than any other make. He sounded like he knew what he was talking about, too. Well, I still say they're all pretty much alike. Um, uh, the price on this one is $235 plus tax. Huh? What do you say, folks? Maybe we ought to look at something else. Well, no, Fulham, well, how much do you want to spend? Not one penny more than the price on the one we pick out. But at least we want to know something about what we're buying. Not so long ago, Tire Service Station magazine wanted to find out what happens when a car owner wants to buy a battery. The plan was very simple. A member of the magazine staff just walked into a service station and announced that he thought he needed a new battery. According to their findings, this example we are about to see reenacted wasn't one of the worst or one of the best. It was just about average. Yes, sir. I want to put a new battery in my car. Yes, sir. Do you have any batteries? What kind of car? 49 Plymouth. Just a minute. What kind of car was it? A 49 Plymouth. Well, we got one battery at $28 and one at $22. Well, what's the difference? Well, one's better than the other. Look, that one on top's a $28 one. The one below is a $22 one. Oh, uh, 
Do I get anything my old battery? Well, I think you get 250 for it. I think. Another organization that made a careful study of retail salesmanship is Fortune Magazine, one of the world's foremost business publications. According to Fortune, no other group of salespeople met by their reporters was as polite, cheerful, and willing to oblige as service station men. But when it came to selling, well, let's listen to what a Fortune reporter had to say about one episode. Following instructions, I had put a really beat up tire on the left rear wheel of my car. One with a bruise that nobody with a half an eye could miss. My orders were to pick a station that definitely was in the tire business. One that looked like they wanted to sell tires. The question was, would the man at the pump try to make a sale? He didn't spot anything wrong, so I said, Say, this tire looks a little low, don't you think? You're right. Wait a minute, I'll get the air hose. Well, I figured he'd be bound to say something about that tire when he started to put air in it. Now it's okay. Say, wait a minute. Look at this. Yeah, that's pretty bad. You know, I don't feel safe riding around on a tire like that. I don't blame you. That could get you in a lot of trouble. Maybe I'd better change it. I would if I were you. I waited to see if he would suggest that I change it for a new tire. But he didn't. So I finally said, I've got a spare in the back. Would you change it for me? Sure, I'd be glad to. Just drive your car around there, away from the pump. Well, that was it. Just the way it happened, according to Fortune. Now, what's your guess? Do you suppose it makes much difference whether people are sold anything or whether they're left to buy what they think they need? After a detailed survey of a number of different types of retail outlets and a careful analysis of the whole situation, here is the conclusion reached by Fortune. The important question about retailing no longer is how much the nation's retailers are selling. It is how much they are not selling. How many sales are salespeople fumbling on any working day? Certainly, it adds up to at least $3 billion a year. And if a statistical answer could be pinned down, it would be one of the most sensational loss figures in business history. That finding definitely includes our business, too, because service stations were among the types of outlets covered in the Fortune study. We also have another reliable source of information on service station salesmanship. For years, the makers of mobile gas have been conducting fact-finding studies regularly on customer service at dealer outlets, including outlets handling competitive brands of products. You're going to see a couple of episodes reenacted according to the information obtained by the more than 900 men and women who were the investigators for the last survey. Their reports covered a number of different subjects, but right now we're concerned with just one thing, what they had to say about selling at the stations they visited. This is typical of the way they worked. Following the survey procedure, the investigator stopped at a station for gas. Now, like any other driver, he didn't really know if his car needed oil or anything else. He depended on someone to tell him. That'll be 135. And that was that. No attempt to lift the hood and check the oil. Nothing unusual about it either. According to the survey, at a total of 3,373 stations visited, there was no attempt to sell motor oil in 21% of the cases. That's about one out of five. Many times, even when the oil was checked, real sales opportunities were missed. In this case, for instance, it'll take a quart. You get the point, of course. This car could have been due for an oil change. Instead of a quart sale, it could have been a five quart sale, plus a new filter. And if an oil change had been sold, the chances are a mobile lubrication sale would have gone along with it, because both are usually due at the same time. As it was, 
the chance for plus sales was lost completely because the driver wasn't asked a simple question like, how far has this oil been driven? In the case of many lost sales, it wasn't even necessary to ask if anything was needed. It was perfectly obvious. Like this badly worn fan belt that spoke for itself every time the hood was lifted. In the same way, failing to take even a quick glance at the tires while this car was on the driveway meant passing up the opportunity to point out a need, and so at least the chance of making a tire sale. Remember, according to the survey, in 21% of the cases, no effort was made to sell motor oil. What do you think it was on other car needs? Like this missing wiper blade? 94%. Aside from motor oil, in 94% of visits made to 3,373 service stations by the investigators, nobody made any effort to sell them anything at all. Take gasoline. Some service station men think there's nothing they can do to improve gasoline sales. And yet, time after time, natural opportunities are missed that can improve any station's gallonage figures. Probably the biggest one is failing to ask for the full tank sale. This motorist is a good example. He asked for 10 gallons, and that's just what he's getting. He isn't being told that just a few more gallons would fill the tank. Maybe he wouldn't buy them. Then again, maybe he would. One thing is sure. Enough people do buy the full tank sale when they're asked for it to make it worthwhile asking every time. Here's another gasoline selling opportunity that's often lost. The driver who comes into a station for information, road maps, or anything else except gasoline, and who leaves without being reminded that filling his tank now will save him a stop later on. And how about this situation? The car that has been left for an oil change, mobile lubrication, or any other kind of service. All too often, it's turned back to the owner without any attempt to sell him a tank full of gasoline before he leaves. And yet, buying gasoline is every motorist's most expected purchase, the one he resists the least. But the seriousness of today's lack of selling isn't limited to gasoline business or oil business. It extends to everything that people buy. Remember this little episode? Do you have any batteries? You know, it's a rare bird who asks that question these days. We all know that on just about every kind of commodity, America's tremendous productive capacity, sooner or later, was bound to start catching up with the nation's demands, despite all the setbacks, despite all the shortages and allocations of critical materials. And so, as a result, these days, fewer and fewer people are just asking for items. More and more people have to be sold. Because for the first time, really, since 1940, we are back in a buyer's market. And in our business, as in every kind of retail business, this change in people's buying habits reestablishes the importance of four simple fundamentals of retail salesmanship. The first one is to understand that customers must be sold. In other words, that there is a need to sell. Maybe that sounds elementary. But if you'll remember, this man had no idea of the need to sell, as proved by the way he asked. Well, did you decide what color you want yet? Here, of course, as in all retailing, even when a customer knows what he or she wants, there is a need to sell. In our business, every dealer should understand that there is a still greater need to sell because 50% of the gross income should come from the item that people most often do not know they need and so must be sold. That in this buyer's market, customers are not going to ask for merchandise, they must be sold. And that the increased cost of doing business these days requires each employee to produce more gross. Every employee should know that his ultimate job is selling not just pumping gas. The second fundamental is being organized to sell, which means having the right stocks of products, good displays, proper tools, and above all, a knowledge of whatever you're selling. That, you will recall, was one big fault of the salesman who tried to sell a couch. This leather or plastic? Oh, it's genuine leather, I guess. At least it looks like leather. Maybe some sort of plastic. Don't you know? 
Oh, yes. Uh, it's that new plastic. It's much better than leather, and it's easy to clean, too. It's made out of true fab. People want to know something about whatever they're offered. And knowing what to tell them is part of being properly organized to sell. The third fundamental is having the desire to sell. Every dealer should want to sell because it means a chance of improving the financial standing of himself and his family and those who work for him. In addition, there is the satisfaction of accomplishment that comes with making a sale. Every station employee should want to sell because selling is part of his job, because it's made worth his while, and because knowing how to sell is a lifetime asset to anybody. That's the fourth fundamental of retail salesmanship, knowing how to sell. Using a sales technique to follow a logical series of steps in making a sales talk. Remember, there's no problem about people buying. They'll be buying all right. More of everything cars need. Why? Because there are more cars in use than ever before. And they're being driven more, too. So there'll be greater demand for the things you sell. But there'll also be greater supply, greater competition, too, creating a buyer's market. Above everything else, that calls for more and better selling by every man in the service station business. That's the problem faced by mobile dealers everywhere. That's the problem tackled by the makers of mobile gas in the Let's Sell program, a proven, practical plan to help mobile dealers and their men with a sound understanding of the need to sell, how to properly organize to sell, creating the essential desire to sell, and using an effective sales technique based on a simplified breakdown of steps to a sale. Just four common sense principles, that's all there is to the let's sell plan. There's nothing complicated about it, but there's nothing magical, nothing quick and easy about it either. Any dealer who expects to get real results out of the let's sell plan must be willing to put into it the time and effort it deserves and needs to make it work. That's the main thing. It does work, as proved by every dealer who has tried it out and really given it a chance. Properly applied, the Let's Sell plan can help any dealer meet the changeover from a seller's to a buyer's market, get the gross profit needed to offset today's higher operating costs, get a full share of today's bigger and better service station business. <laughs>